All right. Do you want me to work? All right. So again, let's let's see what we can do. See what we can do in thirty minutes. I'll try to keep my answers short. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you for doing this. We know you're a busy man. So no, 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 no. It's good. Whenever a school calls, I'm like, yeah, I'm all over it. Okay. So should we go with the first question? Yeah. All right. So the first question is about you mostly, and it's how did you get into the flat Earth theory? I got into flat earth back in 2014. Uh, I never got married or had kids. And so I know you guys aren't old enough to understand this, but if that ever happens, you have tons of free time on your hands, just tons. And because of that, and the internet was new, the internet actually was a new thing back in the day. I looked at just about every conspiracy you could think of. And by about 2014, I had run out. You know, I I have an opinion. I don't like every conspiracy, but there's some I like and some I don't. We won't list them off. And in 2014, I'm like, okay, this part was just like the documentary, which was, all right, flat earth, I'll shoot it down in a weekend. Why not? Because I hate it. And nine months later, I was just banging my head on the keyboard going, there's no way, there's no way, there's no way. And that was basically how, and then I just gave up uh, in 2015 and said, okay, I'm just going to make a series of videos and put them out on the internet with my contact information and say, hey, cry for help. Somebody, somebody shoot this thing down for me. And here we are seven years later and three books and a documentary and a whole bunch of other stuff. And it's been a wild ride. So there you go. Well, oh, so, you- sorry, short, short answer, conspiracy boredom. That's how I got into it. Oh, <laughs> what, what did you personally think of the documentary? Oh, I hated it. But I understood what it was. I, I did not make the documentary, just so you know. Uh, it was done by an L.A. film team. In fact, Netflix didn't make the documentary. Uh, it was done by a team down in Los Angeles that was just doing a side project. And they contacted me and said, yeah, this, is, this seems like it's trending. Let's, let's see what, where it goes. And we spent seven months shooting. And at the end, they, they, didn't, they did not like us at all especially when it came to kids no offense because i know the teacher's probably listening which is there was a there was a i think a 12 year old kid who asked me a question when i was at the at the at the podium uh at the the conference and apparently that was a real uh button for those guys they just lost it it triggered them and uh they they didn't know what to do so they they spun it in you know against us but it was fine it generated a huge amount of interest, which is doesn't matter whether you love a topic or you hate a topic, as long as you're engaged in the topic. And any producer will tell you this, and I've heard this over the last seven years. And so, uh, yeah, everybody in our community hated it, but I sat in studio audiences at film festivals in, in around the country in different countries, and it interested so many people because it felt safe. Even the title, Behind the Curve, because, you know, because they're dumb. Right. Yeah, you know, that was it was a way it's like, oh, they're going to make fun of flat earthers. Let's go in and watch this thing. And it worked. So there you go. Um, so all the attention, like you just you're just glad that it came. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it, there's there's an old saying. Um, e- the, the original saying is even bad press is free. Yeah. Meaning, it, well, hell, look at um, I'm not going to swear here, uh, but look at Andrew Tate recently. Right. <laughs> Andrew Tate has generated huge amounts of social media. He is playing social media like grand piano, right? He knows exactly what he's doing. That is not his character. I've seen earlier interviews. He's a quiet, unassuming guy, but he's found his niche. And it doesn't matter. Again, he could be deplatformed all he wants, but if every YouTube channel is doing a video on him, then by the way, he's one of ours. Uh, if every YouTube channel is doing a video on him, then, then it works. So yeah, even bad press is free press. Yeah. What would be your most confident clue of the earth being flat? Uh, it wouldn't even be one of my clues. It wouldn't, uh, you know, the clues I did were, were very broad strokes. And uh, I mean, yes, I'm, I'm glad that I inspired a whole bunch of people to come up with different clues. But the one that, uh, that I love more than anything, the, well, okay, I'll tell you two. Uh, the one that gets most people into it is long distance photography by far yeah, and yeah. away. Long distance photography, which they don't talk about really in the documentary, which is HD technology has really changed that. You know, uh, 30 years ago before HD, you there was a thing th- before HD, guys, that you could shoot ships long distance and it wouldn't make any difference because everything would be really, really fuzzy. Now you can zoom in on boats that are way, way, way too far. You should not be able to see them. And that's what I did, never encouraged a single person to do that. That's what gets most people. My favorite 
is uh, uh, gravity versus the vacuum of space. So what I mean by that is, and I'll, I'll screw up some terms for you guys, j just, but you'll get it, which is, let's say there's a second floor of where you are right now. Let's say you turn it into a vacuum chamber and you have a valve in front of you, you pull that valve. What happens? It's not like the movies at all. It is not a slow process. It is instant. It is violent. Uh, any scuba diver will tell you this, any, any submarine guy, anybody that has to deal with deep sea pressure, the air will rush upstairs right? It'll equalize. It's the second law of thermodynamics. Pressure cannot exist. I know it's physics and astronomy, but you'll get it. Pressure cannot exist to non-pressure without a barrier. It absolutely cannot without an actual barrier. So the question is, when you go outside, why is our atmosphere still here? And the only response you have, the, literally the only response is gravity. That is, that is the knee-jerk response. And I go, oh, you mean the same gravity that couldn't keep your, the air in your room from running upstairs just 10 seconds ago? That gravity? And then you're kind of stuck because it's like, because you want to say, well, there's more gravity or the atmosphere is much thicker. It's like, okay, tell me, and no scientist has ever, ever been able to tell me what exactly happens at the bleeding edge of space. What happens when our atmosphere ends and space begins? It is the, it, for me, it is by far my favorite, but a lot of people still don't get it. It's tough to visualize because what we're breathing in right now is not a vacuum, but if you put a vacuum chamber in, in a window, you know, right next to you in a room, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference because we can't see, you know, we can't see it. You're, what we're breathing in is 99.99% transparent. So, yeah. yeah. One thing during the doc documentary that I found interesting was uh, the long distance photography and like the sun setting and the different horizons you were talking about, how the sun just like Disappears. Disappears. Now. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I don't know if I talked about it in the Netflix thing, but, uh, or maybe I did. It was, that was a while ago. Um, but yeah, the atmosphere thickness, I, I, let's beat on that for a minute, which is we are not breathing in nothing. In fact, uh, you're not even really breathing in a whole lot of oxygen. It's 80% nitrogen and 20% nit uh, oxygen. We'll throw out the trace gases for now because who cares? Because people will ask, often ask me, and this goes into the sun thing. It's like, okay, why can't you see Hawaii from California? Why can't you see Europe from New York? And why can't you see Mount Everest from everywhere? Because, well, it's the highest place in the world, right? Yeah. And it's because of the thickness of the atmosphere. Uh, it compounds over time. So what we're talking in right now, pretty much transparent. But if you go out 50 miles, it becomes less transparent. You know, 90%, then 80%, then 70%. It's no different really than a thin version of water. Um, so, uh, if you've ever seen those documentaries where you see whales underneath the water, right? But you can only see the whales about 200 yards, 300 yards, and they just fade into obscurity. Any scuba diver will tell you that when you get below 200 feet, there is no co more color. You can't see the sunlight. It could be a summer day and the sun could be absolutely right overhead, but the sun cannot penetrate 200 feet of water in any ocean. So it doesn't even have to be, it could be a really pretty ocean. You're still not gonna be able to see it. So the sun literally just goes off into the distance. We have some fantastic videos. I got a playlist. You know, we, we spent years on this one where it goes off into the distance and just fades away. Yeah. If, if you look at it closely enough, it's like, what? And I, first time I saw one of those videos, it's like, what's happening? But to the naked eye, you're never going to notice. You can't tell without an HD camera. You'll never be able to, to get it. Same thing with the, the sunsets, you know, on a beach. It's like, oh, there's the sun setting. Yeah, until you zoom in on it with a filter with an HD camera, then it pops back up. And then you keep zooming in and zooming in and finally it just goes, whoo, just disappears. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, our next question is, what have you or the community uh, conducted? What experiments have you conducted regarding flat earth? Oh, boy. The big ones, the, the most common ones, again, would be all the people that ran down to the beach with HD cameras. By far and away. 90% of the, the footage, that we, the, the tests that were done were done with those. Um, the, because the, because you're probably saying, well, why, why would you do this? And plus we've done laser experiments along those same distances uh, at night. And then we've done mirror experiments using the sun during the daytime. Uh, we sent up weather balloons for better or for worse, but the, um, the reason why so many of them are done on the ground one, because nobody owns flying cars. But the other thing is that the curvature of the earth, the formula, the scientific formula is roughly eight inches per mile per mile which is eight inches per mile squared, which most people don't even remember once they leave high school, which means it's not like stairs, right? That's just eight inches per mile. Eight inches per mile squared, meaning it gets more and more and more severe because eventually if it's a globe, it's going to have to go vertical. 
So at 10 miles, that is 10 times 10, which is 100 times 8, which is 800 inches. 800 inches of, of curvature at um, 10 miles. That's not a lot. But if you go out to 50 miles, it's pushing 1,670 feet, give or take. That's a lot. So which means eventually you, there are objects no different than any sphere you're looking at. There should be objects on the other side of the hill. You know, you can't see on the other side of a mountain. The Earth, same way. You shouldn't be able to see things eventually on the other side of the hill. And you can say refraction all you want, but we've got some absolutely stunning photography, which it, it, where you have the horizon behind the objects and there's nothing being cut off in the front. So where's the horizon exactly? And I've even had some people in science come back, well, the horizon's invisible. And, and what you're seeing is a complete illusion. It's like, nah, not in all conditions. Oh, by the way, those experiments vary widely because again, what we're breathing in is not nothing. And temperature affects it, humidity affects it, atmospheric pressure affects it, uh, all sorts of fun things. You know, the weather just plays havoc with, with our experiments. We try to go on clear days. There you go. So regarding like the dome and firmament, yeah. Um, would it be like, do you, could you like predict what, it, like how high it would be or like what it'd be made out of? And was like everybody believe in it? No, no, excellent questions. You guys have been doing your homework. Uh, okay, so in our community, maybe 70%, 70, 75% of people believe in a dome. So for, for anyone watching this, we, you're not living in a tiny little rock covered in a little bit of water and a little bit of, of gas, right? Flying through space. You're living in a building with walls and a floor and a ceiling. Uh, probably shaped like a dome on the inside, but the outside is probably squared off. It's probably a big box on the outside because, well, engineering loves right angles and they hate curves. In fact, computers, you can't draw a, a, a sphere in a computer. Not really, because that's why pixels are pixels. Pixels are always square. So when it comes to what you're looking at, you're probably looking at a very shallow domed sports stadium. So it doesn't have to be very, you know, I, people say snow globe because, well, it's easy to understand. It's like everyone's seen a snow globe, which a really, really high arc, but you don't need a really, really high arc. If it's, if it's 25,000 miles wide, let's just say, uh, not counting Antarctica and whatever's out there, then the, the height of the dome might even be 3,000 miles high. And that's, that's, not a, that's not a lot, but at the same time, that's more enough for our civilization. Remember, most of the people you know, 99% of the people you know, live between sea level and one mile up. Uh, commercial airlines cap out at 10 miles. Spy planes, if you believe them, cap out at 20 miles. That's not very high. So even if you had a dome that was only a couple hundred miles high, uh, you could get away with it. You could pull, put an entire civilization in there. But uh, for three thousand miles, that eh, we're just giving, you know, we're we're just throwing that number out there. Why not? Yeah. So, so would you say the stars are like actual physical things, or are they just like generated lights in the power? sky? No different than a planetarium. No different than a planetarium, with the exception of better technology. I mean, we have what eight K stuff right now. Well, what would we have if we could go another thousand years? What sort of technology could, could we produce there? So if you're in a planetarium, I throw this, I know it's, I'm a little dated when I say that because you guys probably don't even know what a planetarium is. Back in the day, kids, when you were really bored, you could go to a building and sit on your backs and watch stars, you know, in, inside, basically the inside of a very small sports stadium type thing. So the, the question is, okay, do you see Jupiter up there in the planetarium? Yes, you do. Can you land on it? No, you can't. Why not? Because it's just a light on a ceiling. Okay. When you walk out of that building, who's to say you're just not in a much, much bigger building? And I know that sounds a little bit like science fiction, but to us, yeah, sure, it would be. Uh, outside of our world, why, or outside of our civilization, why, why wouldn't it be possible? There's been st novels that have talked about this for a long, long time. So, and by the way, the short version again, who it depends on who's listening, we had nothing to, the, to do with the building of this place at all. Yeah. We just we just kept the secret. In fact, our civilization didn't even figure it out until we had the technology to do so, which was about 1960. And so, if you find out in 1960, do you tell everybody? Nah, nah, no way, too disruptive. But go ahead. Yeah, at our school, we actually have a physical dome, a part of our building. Yeah. So it was just. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's awesome. And by the way, if you want to look up something fun, uh, go into Google and type in ancient cosmologies and click on images. Every culture, even the Greeks, even though the Greeks ch changed their mind later, every culture drew the exact same thing. 
for a long, long time. I don't care what culture it was. You'll see a wonderful collage of it, which is they drew a snow globe or some sort of dome structure because yeah. the, the stars curved overhead. Now, how they noticed this, I mean, granted, you were really bored 500 years ago and you sat up and stared at the stars for hours and hours on end, but they figured it out. So, Would you say the sun's real or is it just another CGI? Uh... Uh, I'm torn on that one because it's generating a light, no question, and it's generating some heat. Yeah, no question. Um, but could it be something like... Um, <laughs> If you take a magnifying glass to a sun, right, and you, and you generate a point on the ground, that point is extremely bright. In fact, that point even generates its own heat. So could the sun be just a point of light that's being generated from another source? Very, very possible. Uh, the bigger question is, what's the moon? Which is, if the sun and the moon are roughly the same size, say 50 miles wide, and eh, let's say 300, 000, or 3,000 miles high, uh, then the sun cannot be reflecting the moon's li uh, sun's light. I'm sorry, the moon cannot be reflecting the sun's light, which means the moon is generating its own light. You can go out and test with a point and click. I think I've got one of these damn things around here. The uh, a point and click infrared thermometer, one of these twenty dollar jobs, and test the moon shadow versus the moonlight. It is warmer in the moon shadow than it is the moonlight for up, up to depending on how big the moon is, uh, thirteen degrees Fahrenheit. That's impossible. Meaning it's colder in the in the sun shade. But why is it warmer in the moon shape? Uh, and science, this blows scientists. And they don't even know what to do with it because most of them have never heard of it before. But we can test it with copper strips. We can test it with uh, predator vision. You know, there's cameras with predator vision now. Yeah. And it's, it's all absolutely real. Even I dismissed it. And uh, I was into Flat Earth like a year before I heard that one. So, hmm. um, Next question. Uh, a lot of people in the community say, like, dinosaurs never happened. What uh, do you know? I hate that one. Okay. I believe the dinosaurs happened. Yes, there are. Okay. Let's preface this. When you get into flat earth, the biggest problem is when you get into flat earth, it is such a big concept, which means if the whole world is a big hoax, then everything in it must be a hoax. And there's a new term out there called auto hoaxing, which is whatever you see on the news has got to be fake immediately. So it's, it's, it's guilty until proven innocent. Yeah. You know, the opposite of our legal system. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, so when people, and so if everything's fake, therefore dinosaurs must be fake. Do I believe that the giant reptiles roam the earth? Yeah, I do. Uh, and anyone listening would probably upset them. But at the same time, do I believe in the carbon dating system? No, I don't. No, I don't. Not, not, even, not even for a little bit. Uh, there's a wonderful fish out there you can look up called the coelacanth. C O E L. A C A N T H. Fantastic example. Uh, it's a big, ugly fish with a whole bunch of extra fins, right? Yeah. Every scientist decades ago would have said this thing is absolutely extinct. It's been extinct for 70 million years, right? And, and they would have bet the farm. I mean, they would have, everyone would have bet every cent they had on this. It's like, oh, dead for 70 million years. And then the British Navy catches one off of South Africa. And then another one off of Madagascar, another one off, off of Mozambique. And pretty soon they figure out, it's like, oh, wow, they're all over Africa. So how did they screw this up so badly? And how did the, you know, because, you know, the carbon dating system was involved here. That's a prehistoric fish. So when I, someone comes back and say, Mark, do you believe in the Loch Ness Monster? Do you guys know what the Loch Ness Monster is? Yes. Okay. Reptilian dinosaurs potentially living in the, the murky lakes of England and other places. Do I believe in them? Why the hell not? And people say, well, because they've been extinct for at least 100 million years, right? And they go, you mean like that fish? That one right over there? That yeah. fish, which, you can, which National Geographic is swimming around with right as we speak? That one? And, and so I say that fish is absolutely just an just a, uh, anomaly, right? But everything else, no, no, that's absolutely true. There's, no, there's no, nothing else except that fish. And that's the, the tough part about science. Science sticks to their guns, and it's absolutely real until it's not. Let me throw one more out at, at you really quick, which is, um, and we, we still got time, which is uh, the giant panda, a great example. Scientists just laughed, absolutely laughed. It's like, okay. So there's a big black and white teddy bear looking thing. In the woods, he only eats bamboo and he just lays on his back all day and, and acts cute. That's a real thing. And they laughed and they laughed and they laughed until they caught one. It's like, oh, okay, well, it's real now. It's, it's, I hate that about science. It drives me insane. They never apologize for anything. 
So do you believe in the asteroids killing all the dinosaurs? And like, if it was inside the dome or it came through the dome? Uh, do I believe in terraforming between civilizations? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Uh, whoever built this place tends to, I, I think they've evolved in, with time. They've, they've done things less and less extreme. Throwing a giant rock at, at the world to wipe out a species, probably not the most efficient thing in the world. And by the way, that goes into where we are. You know, our, our unbroken civilization only goes back 5,000 years. But we're not the first people to be here, the first people to rent this apartment. I mean, look at uh, the Bosnian pyramids, the real pyramids, Puma Punku, Machu Picchu, uh, the sunken cities off of Japan, the sunken cities off of India. There's all sorts of remnants of previous civilizations. Uh, but do they have to be terraformed? Yeah, I believe it's, this place is really like a school, which is every, you know, once a civilization reaches a certain point, they have to leave. Right? They, they've got to move on to wherever they go after this, kind of like seniors, right? You know, once you graduate, it's like you don't have to go home, but you got to get the hell out of here because we got a whole nother class coming in. There you go. So in your documentary, you brought up the Arctic Treaty. Can you just say Antarctic, Antarctic Treaty? Antarctic oh, Antarctic Treaty. Oh, yeah, yeah. The Antarctic Treaty. Brilliant. Uh, that was I just stumbled across that thing, which is it's the only bro unbroken treaty in the history of treaties. It was established roughly in 1959. And about the same time that we announced the Van Allen belts, and it basically locks down Antarctica from private, the private sector forever. It says, and you, you look at them online, the PDFs out there, and if you don't, if you can't find it, I'll, I'll send it to you, but it's easy to find, mm -hmm. uh, which basically says that no private corporation is allowed to set up shop from any country ever. <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about? No one even owns Antarctica. It's like, so, well, you know, it, it, it was a huge red flag for me. In the United States, as you know, if you wanted to start, if a, you know, the oil and gas companies, they want to start fracking in your neighbor's backyard, they could make that happen in a week. They could have to jump in there really, really quick. It's like, and yet this place, Antarctica, which is this entire mountain range made out of coal and oil and gas and uranium and all sorts of other minerals. And not only are we not even allowed to go down there, you know, no, only the military and military scientists are, are allowed to go down there. But we're not even allowed to talk about it. That's the part that blows me away. I mean, you got massive companies like, like uh, Shell and ExxonMobil with huge amounts of liquid resources, and they can't even run full page ads saying, it'd be really, really great to go down there and create jobs and economic stability and all this. It's like, nope. In fact, you, the, even the treaty is not up for review until 2041. How does that happen? Really, a treaty pushing 1960 has, a, you know, we're not even going to review the policy until 80 years later. <sighs> mind blowing. Absolutely mind blowing. The, the world runs off money and power and greed. And this bypasses all of it. It says, oh, yeah, you know, what, what conspiracy could be out there bigger? And by the way, if you want to know why you do something like that, it's because you have an oil and gas company with all sorts of decent tech, right? And all of a sudden, one of their planes goes off course. And it gets, goes into some zone, which you really don't want them to go into, maybe some out where near the outer marker. And th then, you know, that discussion is like, what do we do with those guys? Well, it's a loose end you got to tie up, wink, wink. And how many of those loose ends do you have to tie up? Before suddenly finally says, you know what, don't even, don't, let's not even lay anybody down here. It's gonna be too much of a hassle. So that's what they did. It's brilliant. Uh -huh. So how deep do you think like the earth's crust is before we, I don't, how would you say go? Through the dome or the firmament? Oh, yeah. Uh, eight feet. You can get a shovel and test this right now. No, I'm kidding. Uh, it is... Uh, well, that's just it. We don't know because mainstream science doesn't know. The yeah. deepest hole ever drilled... Uh, and I'll... Thank God you guys are American because otherwise I have to convert to kilometers. Is less than eight miles. That's the deepest hole anyone's driven. The Russians and the, the Germans tried it for years, years and years, tried to punch past eight miles and they could never, ever do it. And you say, well, you know, because it could be because of magma or blah, blah, blah. I go, no, that's not the point. The point is, if you can only drill down eight miles and according to the globe, it's 4,000 miles to the center of the earth, what are you showing us exactly in those cross sections, right? It's, a, you know, those wonderful cross sections where you have red and orange and yellow and white perfect 1,000 mile thick bands and there's nothing happening in there. And you realize after a while, it's like, you have no, they have no idea. In fact, if you look up the wiki entry, you can see in the fine print, it's like, oh yeah, we have no idea what's down there, which is extrapolating from volcanoes. So it's like, okay, why are you showing me this? It's like, well, we got to take our best guess. And why don't you put a big question mark in the center of the globe? So that's, that's not what we do. We're science. <laughs>
we we just put our diagram. It's like, yeah, but what about Jupiter and Saturn? You put a cross section on them too at Mars. It's like, uh, anyway, sorry, I get worked out. Oh, yeah. So do you believe like there's objects outside of the dome, like say the other planets? Or no, but the, okay, no planets, but there are objects. So in a planetarium, nothing you see on the sky is real. The stars aren't real. The comets aren't real. The planets aren't real. I mean, yeah, I mean, this, yeah, the planets are floating around and do anything. You know, they look three dimensional. Of course, we can we can do that with HD technology all day. Even holograms, we can we can mess with that a little bit. Uh, you know, can you land on them? No. What's outside? So space is absolutely a, a it's an illusion. It's a very, very good illusion, and 99.9% .9 of the people buy it, which is why you create an illusion. Uh, outside of this place, for me, it's either a whole bunch of more of these buildings, snow globes, and different uh, uh, levels of technology, you know, some in the Stone Age, some in pre industrial, and so on and so on, or an unlimited universe. Uh, don't forget, you know, people say, wait, well, what's outside of it? Well, if, if this is a one off, and I do not believe this is a one off, but if it is a one off, then and if this world is 99.9% .9 conflict, meaning it doesn't matter how beautiful, how powerful, how rich, how talented you are, there is always something to complain about. Hardly anyone's ever completely happy ever. Then what's out of the side of this place has to be 99.9% .9 unlimited. And I think it's cyclical. I, I think we're here. I think we're here basically as a school. So this is a learning experience. The world can only be one of three things. It can only be uh, entertainment. I don't think that's the case because not a lot of people are having fun. It's a prison planet. Uh, it's awfully nice for a jail. I don't buy that. Or it's a school, and which is kind of a mix of, of a whole bunch of things. And that's what it feels like to me. This has always felt like a place where we're supposed to gain perspective. Do you believe in like, so the people like people who control us could be like the aliens possibly? Or is it like? Well, okay. That's a whole, that's a whole nother thing. We'll see how much time we got. How much time we got? We can go past. Okay. Um, so here's the thing with aliens. Do I believe there's things flying up there that aren't us? Yeah. Are they the U.S. Air Force? Not most of them, no. Uh, you, can, you can take night vision binoculars. Binoculars, by the way, not just night vision. Uh, something in a five power or higher. And you can turn them on at night. You guys suggested this to me years ago, way before I got into flat earth. Sky is crawling with things. Absolutely crawling with stuff. And you say, well, I, the first day it's like, wow, it's a bunch of satellites. And then you see them moving in ways that satellites don't move. A lot of them. And you realize that there's a, something in here with us. Previous civilizations, again, that I, that I listed earlier. So do I think that that's one of the big questions? Are there other civilizations, older versions? Do I think they're aliens from Mars and Venus and Jupiter? No. Do I think they're older versions of us? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Uh, and the big question is, are they in here with us? Are they, are they trapped or can they come and go as they please? I kind of like to think they're in here with us and there's protocols in place. Yeah, meaning there are rules, meaning uh, one of the oldest UFO arguments is why don't they land in the middle of downtown Chicago and come out and take some selfies and sign some autographs and stuff and because that would change everything, right? Yeah. There's some proto, it's prime directed from Star Trek. So if that was the case, then, you know, what's the word I'm, word I'm looking for here? Let me, sorry, what was the initial question? <laughs> Like, like who's like controlling us? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So who built it? You know, it really goes yeah. into one of two things, right? Which is an even a higher, higher place than, than, than uh, um, them. So you're either talking about an ancient civilization that's older and more powerful than our own and even bigger than the aliens that are in here with us or the divine. But really, you're just kind of splitting hairs yeah. because one man's advanced tech is another man's deity. You know what I'm saying? If, if somebody, if a shift landed in Chicago tomorrow, Two things would happen. One would be a group of people that would come in and say, oh, wow, they do look like the blue people from Avatar. Isn't that cool? You know, all the nerds would do that. And then you'd have another group and say, we must start a church and worship the blue people right now. And they, they would. And you'd have religions that would be built up around this. And so, uh, by the way, that, this, this, that was the thing I forgot, completely spaced it out. You want to look up the, the greatest UFO sighting of all time? Look up the 1561 Nuremberg event. Absolutely brilliant. It wasn't Roswell. It wasn't 1899 Texas. It wasn't, uh, you know, pre-World War II, 1561 Germany. There's even a wiki entry on it, which is uh, April, a beautiful spring day in April in Nuremberg, Germany, two giant armadas, space aircraft carriers come in and just start beating the hell out of each other. And then finally, a, a third faction shows up and breaks it up. It took a full hour 
for this to happen. Of course, there was no photography back then, but they sketched the whole thing out. Not a cloud oh. in the sky. It was absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Oh, that's that's crazy. <laughs> so do you have any questions for us? Yeah. Uh, yeah, just a couple. What, uh, how'd you get into it? How, how'd you, uh, how'd you find, what, what made you decide to call me this morning? So this past week, we watched your documentary behind the curve in class yes yeah. oh, of course i'm surprised by the way how many classes get to watch that now so that's cool it was, okay it was about a three day three to four day process and then we were given uh different topics to present to pre present on yeah and uh ours were what clues does mark Sargent give uh give us in his youtube videos and um, we saw your your youtube channel with your contact info we like thought like how cool would it be to like actually get Mark Sargent himself to talk for us? That that is, and thank you, is flattering. Uh, I, yeah, that's why I put it out there. Um, well, I initially put it out there my my contact info, which is I never recommend for anybody to do, especially girls. To this day, <laughs> do not do it. Uh, which is I put it out there so that academics could get a hold of me because again I couldn't solve I could not prove the globe in a court of law. That was the, the, my big thing. And so I put all my contact out for info out there immediately and said, okay, somebody with a PhD or a master's in something, get a hold of me and tell me not just the obvious stuff, tell me other things I may have missed. And I was getting contacted by all sorts of other people, people they didn't talk about in the documentary, you know, um, all sorts of pilots and air traffic controllers and engineers and um, just about everybody from the military, which was fascinating to, to me. You know, the, the, one of the big things they all said, it's like, it doesn't matter what weapon you fire. We never take the curvature into the, the firing solution or the spin of the earth, which we didn't talk about, which is, you know, the, the Coriolis effect. That never gets factored in either. And he goes, oh, yeah, we hear, it, we, we hear about it, but it never, ever comes into play. It doesn't matter how far you're firing. So whenever I see a CNN story, it's like, oh, yeah, this sniper had to take it into account the curvature of the earth. I just laugh. Because I've got a whole bunch of military friends that say, yeah, never, ever in a million years. So well, anyway, the hey, teacher's Mark, I, here, which means we are done. Yeah. <laughs> Mark, thanks a lot, man. Um, if they have any follow-up questions, could they uh, send you them again? Would you mind? Or Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, whatever you guys need. If there's any specific resources, uh, I've, if I can't find it, I can direct you. Or if there's any other person that you ever, ever wanted to talk to that you see on the internet, if I don't know them directly, I'm I'm wired in, so I can get you in touch with them. Thank yeah. you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thanks for your message earlier about hey, it's okay to disagree and agree, but as long as you have that conversation, that's what oh, I yeah, want, yeah, yeah. That's what I want them to have, you know. I don't mind. Hey, at least you guys weren't yelling at me. So <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. So thanks, hey, guys. Thanks again, man. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. All right, you too. Bye bye.